bring it on! Five years ago in February 2011, I did my very first review on the original Metroid. We have gone through many of Samus Aran's adventures, from exterminating giant brains in the 8-bit and 16-bit era, to wiping out every single Metroid on the go, to ridding of all Phazon in 3D. 49 videos later on this channel, we've come to our latest adventure yet on the Nintendo Wii, Metroid Other M. I especially remember the commercial for this one back in the summer of 2010. It was as if we were seeing a live-action Metroid movie that never saw the light of day, and it still looks awesome. It was clear from this commercial that Other M was going to be looking at Samus' deep thoughts, which seemed like a really good idea, because when you think about it, Samus never actually had a personality. All we knew about her in the other games was that she was a badass bounty hunter that blew up whole planets, that was all we needed. Giving character to a protagonist that's been silent for nearly 25 years at the time was going to be an extremely difficult task. And taking that chance is not only Nintendo again, but also Team Ninja. Yep, the Ninja Gaiden and Dead or Alive guys themselves. When we heard about this, a majority of people predicted that the collaboration with Team Ninja would be both a good thing and a bad thing. On one hand, the Ninja Gaiden style of gameplay in the Metroid universe seemed like it would play out amazingly. I know I was beyond excited when I heard about it. I thought it was the coolest idea ever for a video game, since I was a big Ninja Gaiden fan at the time. But, on the other hand, since the staff at Team Ninja consisted of 15-year-olds, that also meant Samus could have been overly sexualized like most of the females in their games. See my Hyrule Warriors review for more on that. But before we go any further with Other M, why don't we quickly talk about two Metroid spin-offs for the Nintendo DS, Metroid Prime Hunters and Metroid Prime Pinball. I'm gonna start with Prime Hunters first, released in 2006. The Galactic Federation sends Samus to investigate the legend of the Olympic Cluster that is told to obtain ultimate power. If it's helpful, then it should be kept a secret, but if it's dangerous, then Samus needs to destroy it. She isn't the only one aware of this power though, as six other bounty hunters are searching for the Olympic Cluster themselves. Spoiler alert, all of it is a trick played by a large creature called Goria, who's trapped by the Olympic race in a starship called the Oubliette. Goria absorbs the powers of the other bounty hunters, but Samus defeats it before escaping the Oubliette, ending the game. Since this is a spin-off title, the story doesn't tie in with the other Prime games whatsoever, but in the chronology, it takes place after Prime 1 and before Prime 2. It's an overall decent enough story for a standalone Metroid game, nothing too complicated, but nothing too simple either. On a side note, it should also be said that Metroid fans are debating whether or not the ship that appears at the end of Prime 3 belongs to the bounty hunter Silex, who appears in Prime Hunters. But there still isn't any confirmation or sequel to let us know for sure. In terms of the gameplay, well, you remember when the trailers for Prime 1 came out and everybody was really afraid that it was going to be a generic first-person shooter? Prime Hunters has made that a reality. Okay, I wouldn't go that far, but instead of an action-adventure Prime game that we've come to know and love, Prime Hunters plays like a somewhat typical first-person shooter, with small rooms filled with enemies and different weapon types with ammo to try and make up for the disappearance of upgrades in this game, the keyword being try. You can still find expansions for missiles, energy tanks, and ammo for your weapons, but as for actual upgrades, you get nada. Which for a Metroid fan is a huge turnoff. Like in Prime 3, you have to visit different planets where the goal for each one is to obtain three Olympic artifacts, use them to gain access to the boss room, collect this crystal called an Octolith after defeating them, and escape the planet before it doesn't explode. Yeah, I really don't know why we have to escape the planets. It's rather annoying, especially if you screw up somewhere or run out of time and you have to start from the very beginning of the countdown. In order to reach the final area of the game, you need to obtain all eight Octoliths. Since there are only four planets though, in DD that means we have to travel to each planet twice and access the new area we couldn't before. But aside from that, there isn't much exploration involved in Prime Hunters, and the puzzles are so simple that they're only there to waste your time. Mostly being scan this object here or clear the room of enemies to advance type of puzzles. Prime Hunters' biggest problem, however, is the control. There are four button layouts you can choose from, but none of them feel natural whatsoever. You see, despite the Nintendo DS carrying the same amount of buttons as the GameCube titles, Prime Hunters doesn't control at all like Prime 1 and 2. You have to move Samus with the D-pad and use the stylus to aim her gun and control the camera like a mouse, as well as double tapping the touchscreen to jump or go really out of your way to press one of the face buttons. Since I'm left-handed, however, that means I'd have to use the face buttons to move instead, making it even more cramp-inducing. 
You are able to use the face buttons or the D-pad to control the camera, but that feels strange too. I'm sure if there was a lock-on feature available like in the console Prime games, then this wouldn't be so much of an issue, but I can only dream. The best control scheme for this kind of game should have gone like this. The D-pad to move Samus with the left and right buttons rotating her, A to shoot, B to jump, Y to shoot missiles, X to change to morph ball form, R to look around, and L to lock on. That's precisely how it controls in the GameCube Prime game, so it seems like a really obvious choice to go with them, but why didn't the producer see that? This is probably because Prime Hunters wasn't made by Retro Studios who made the other Prime games. It's actually made by Nintendo Software Technology, who were the people behind Wave Race Blue Storm and the Mario vs. Donkey Kong series. Prime Hunters also came out relatively early in the DS's lifespan, and that meant every game back then had to have touchscreen gimmicks of some sort added to them. But going back to the gameplay, from time to time you'll come across the other bounty hunters who only serve as a minor inconvenience before carrying on with your day. And they all come back after you defeat them anyway, in different rooms and in different planets, so it doesn't really mean anything apart from unlocking the doors. The bosses in general can be rather repetitive. If it's not the other bounty hunters you find in the game, it's these two exact same bosses every time you're closer to the Octolith meaning you have to fight them both four times in the whole game, with only the final battle against Goria being different and having two ways of beating him, leading to a bad ending or a good ending. The single player campaign overall isn't bad, but it isn't a Metroid game. It's a repetitive first person shooter that just happens to star Samus and her ship and I can only recommend Prime Hunters to a small group of people. A majority of people tend to praise this game mainly for the online multiplayer. I would show you guys some online gameplay, but unfortunately the servers are now shut down. From what I remember, it was certainly better than it was in Prime 2. It had a lot more maps, game modes, and characters to play as, but it didn't have as much meat as the Halo or Call of Duty games had, so there wasn't really much point in investing a lot of time in the online multiplayer. Playing an online shooter on the go sounds good in concept, but that would mean that you need to continuously get a decent internet connection everywhere you go. I'm sure Prime Hunters has its fans, and while I did enjoy this back when I was an 11-year-old child, from the perspective of a 21-year-old Metroid fanatic, this unfortunately doesn't hold up for me anymore. Okay, now on to 2005's Metroid Prime Pinball, then I promise we'll move on to Other M. Well, it's Pinball with a hint of Metroid. The tables are based on locations from the very first Prime game, and the objective to completing Prime Pinball is exactly the same. Yeah, you can actually finish a pinball game. Anyway, just like in Prime 1, you need to travel between each table and collect 12 Chozo artifacts by winning various minigames, like exterminating Metroids or Space Pirates, shooting down Shriek Bats that come towards you, or defeating a boss. Well, one of the two bosses that you can battle against before the climax. Once you collect all 12 artifacts, you have to transport yourself to the Chozo Temple and defeat Meta Ridley, who can simply piss right off. If his bombs touch anywhere near the Morph Balls, they instantly obliterate, and you can only afford to lose so many before you run out and can't fill in all the holes to defeat him. And then you have to fight Metroid Prime itself. By this point of the game, you're really nervous about losing all of your lives. Your hands begin to sweat and your nerves are intense, causing you to panic and pray to God you don't screw up. But with enough patience, it is possible to defeat him. Keep in mind that all of this happens during multi-mission mode. The single mission mode just has you pick a particular table and gain a high score. Prime Pinball is merely a distraction if you've run out of Metroid games to play, or need some quick entertainment if you don't have much time. If you enjoy Pinball, then you may enjoy Prime Pinball. If you don't, then I'm afraid this game may not be for you. Oh boy, this is really it, isn't it? We've only got one more Metroid game to talk about. There have been some really mixed feelings about this one. Some people quite like it, other people tremendously hate it. Well, if I'm going to keep my sanity, someone's going to have to keep me tame. So, John, come help me with this review and give the audience a different outlook for this game. You couldn't have brought me in on a better game than this. <sighs> okay, here we go. This is our review of Metroid Other M for the Nintendo Wii. Does anyone else find it weird that the abbreviation for this game is MOM? Metroid Other M in the timeline takes place immediately after the events of Super Metroid, starting us off with a climactic battle against Mother Brain and the death of the baby Metroid. Well, spoiler alert! After leaving Planet Zebus, she receives a distress signal called Baby's Cry from a space station known as the Bottle Ship and heads on there. Samus sees that the place is desolate, but not until a Galactic Federation team comes in, where among them are her old companions, Anthony Higgs. Fancy meeting you here, Princess! Who should get a smack for calling the greatest bounty hunter in the world Princess? And there's also Adam Malkovich from Metroid Fusion. 
Now what I didn't even touch on in the Fusion review was that Samus thinks of Adam as a father figure despite treating her rather harshly for leaving the Galactic Federation. Though thinking about how many jobs she's gotten from the Federation in these games, I don't really think she left to begin with. Anyway, Adam tells the team not to give out details of their mission to Samus, but after she saves them from this purple monster, he quickly changes his mind and asks Samus to join the patrol under the condition that she follows his orders and waits to authorize her power-ups. Hold on, what? Uh, no, it's this plot point, isn't it? Okay, here's the deal. With the exception of the X-ray visor, energy tanks, and missile expansions, Samus has all of her equipment that she obtained in Super Metroid. But the only reason we can't use them is because Adam says so. Are you serious? I don't think this amount of stupidity needs any further explanation. This is hands down the worst excuse to not using your equipment in any Metroid game. And we've already had our fair share of odd excuses for losing it. Adam's reasoning behind this isn't very justifiable either. He basically says that Samus doesn't know how powerful she is and she could cause damage to the bottle ship and his crew, especially with the use of power bombs. Alright, power bombs, fair enough. But what exactly is the harm for using something like my beam weapons? Unless Samus is extremely trigger happy or has butterfingers, she's always been careful about shooting innocent beings. And what about her suits? Is she not allowed to protect herself? The hell kind of logic is that? But this isn't the only time Adam makes boneheaded moves. Oh no, there's a fair bit more. The amount of dumb decisions this guy makes is just flat out insulting. But I'll get to that later. Eventually, Samus and the team learn that the battleship's director's name is Madeline Bergman. She's been gathering research on illegal bioweapons for the Galactic Federation, but not before passing this cute little creature that's devoured the remains of the boss Samus previously destroyed. Isn't he just adorable? Later in the game, we come across this creature again who's evolved into this nasty looking thing and it goes after Samus and the team, presumably because of hormones. So is this what happens to Pokemon when they evolve? What? Pikachu is evolving? Oh god! Oh god, I'm gonna be sick. Oh god, it's everywhere! Samus tries to pursue the beast but encounters a woman who's suddenly ambushed by a bulldozer that's controlled by a traitor of the Galactic Federation. That Samus calls the Deleter. Would you like to know who this double crosser is? <laughs> so would I, but the game never really goes anywhere with it. It kind of just stops after a while and we just kind of forget about him. It's implied that it could be the character James since he's the last one to die. Yeah, spoiler alert by the way. But the overall subplot kind of gets forgotten about and we just never hear anything about it again. And to be honest, I don't really think I care because let's face it, the characters in this game are just completely flat. Yeah, that's something I'd really like to bring up. Other M's bigger emphasis on story and character development compared to the other games sounded like an intriguing idea, especially for Nintendo standards, but the execution is honestly rather poor. Much like the Tomb Raider reboot, aside somewhat from Samus and Adam, the characters barely take any time to establish themselves and are just there to either sprout exposition, sometimes quite useless exposition, or to simply die. Adam is a total dumbass throughout the entire game, and even Samus almost does nothing to add character. Except through a lot, and I mean a lot, of monologuing. It was the first joint mission I'd been a part of since becoming a freelance bounty hunter. And of course, it was the first time since my Federation days that I was following the orders of a commanding officer. Oh yeah, I suppose I should really talk about that, shouldn't I? Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in the Metroid series, Samus can actually speak, and Nintendo really wants you to remember that. The voice is provided by Jessica Martin, who actually hasn't done a lot of important roles. And by God does it show here. You can tell the lack of acting experience Miss Martin has in this game, because Samus 90% of the time puts on a monotone voice like she's a robot that doesn't understand human feelings. She gets a little more into it when it comes to the emotional scenes, but there are only about two or three of these in the whole game. Granted, Samus has had a lot of trauma in her life, and it must have been pretty tough to figure out what kind of voice a silent character for 25 years has, but she doesn't sound like she gives a damn a lot of the time. I awoke to the familiar voice of a quarantine officer. A dream. I had been reliving the tragic moments of my recent past. The acting overall isn't that spectacular by any means. Hardly anyone tries to be one with their character. And unfortunately, this isn't the kind of acting that can be laughed at. Like in Resident Evil, Castlevania, Symphony of the Night, or the Zelda CDI games. It's all just very dull and lifeless. And we can't even find ourselves getting engaged with any of the characters. The script doesn't really help either. There's a ton of dialogue to be said in this game, and most of it is very shoddily written. Though thankfully, not to the extent of Titanic. But there are some lines that either come off unnatural, or just don't make any sense. Mother, time to go. 
I swear Hideo Kojima must have slipped in somewhere during the development process too, because these cutscenes go on for a while, with the longest one being about 25 minutes. Other M certainly tries to be as deep and complex as the Metal Gear games, but because of the problems we mentioned, it almost completely fails. If you can get yourself emotionally involved with the characters, then, well, good for you, because I certainly can't, and neither can John. Adam finds the location of the reptile we saw earlier, but when we do come across it, we see that it's evolved again into her arch nemesis Ridley. By the way, can I quickly point out, I caught on to what room we were in because of the stage in Smash 4, which means technically Ridley's big reveal was spoiled for me. Ugh, this scene. This scene. Folks, ever since Other M came out, this part here has become the most infamous scene in the entire series, and if you've played it, you know why. But, I can't assume all of you know what it is, so let's take a look at how the scene plays out. So while you're pondering how a little birdie thing can evolve into a dragon, Ridley starts going towards Samus, but she does nothing to stop him because... She's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Alright, just to recap, Ridley and the Space Pirates killed Samus' parents right in front of her when she was a child, and yes, that's a horrible thing to witness, especially for such a young girl. But how many times has Samus encountered and killed Ridley at this point? Five times! That's five times she's confronted him and she's still scared shitless! Why? She should have been over this by now! She's gotten her revenge more times than the Bride has in Kill Bill! If this took place before the first game, then this reaction would make sense. But this is after Super Metroid. There's no reason she should be acting like this and have Anthony come save her and sacrifice his life. There you go, Aaron. Get mad. Kick his ass. Do what you do best. Make boss battles easy. After Ridley's boss battle, he escapes the fight before Samus can finish him off and manages to meet up with the woman she saved, who tells her that she's Madeline Bergman. While at the research center, she explains that the bottle ship has a cloning program and an AI called MB was created to control Metroids that are invulnerable to cold temperatures and are held in a secret area called Sector Zero. The stupid thing is, however, that the MB program is an artificial intelligence based on Mother Brain. Because that went so well the last three times there was a Mother Brain in charge, but hey, fourth time's a freaking charm! So taking a break from the story, how's the gameplay? Straight to the point? Eh. Samus can only be controlled with the Wiimote sideways. Yep, just the Wiimote. No nunchuck add-on or classic controller support, just the Wiimote. Apparently, the developers wanted to make the game more simple to play compared to the other games, but if you ask us, this control scheme does not do Other M justice. You get used to controlling Samus with the D-pad, but to begin with, it's a teeny bit flimsy and wears on your thumb after a while. This isn't a PlayStation 1 game, guys. We have analog sticks now. You turn into your morph ball form with the A button, jump and wall kick with the 2 button, and shoot the nearest enemy with the 1 button. Yeah, that's another problem with being restricted by the Wiimote. Samus automatically aims at the closest enemy you're facing, so that, and the fact that a lot of enemies die only after a few hits, there isn't much of a challenge to other M. To make the controls even more awkward though, the only way to fire missiles in this game is to point your Wiimote at the TV, hold the B button, lock around, lock on, and then press the A button to fire. And during all this, Samus is staying completely still. There is no possible way for her to move, unless you're dodging, which is incredibly stupid. What kind of bounty hunter stays still for this long to aim and shoot? It takes like 5 seconds to shoot one missile. Which doesn't sound like much, but in a fast paced adventure game like this, you need every valuable second you can get. Which other end thoroughly wastes by giving you complicated controls, completely destroying the intention of making this game accessible. What's worse for me was, I was so far from the TV, I had to use the Wii U gamepad to do all my pointing the Wiimote crap. You could only imagine how disorienting this stupid point to shoot was for me. Missiles aside, the power-ups all act as they should do. Well, eventually anyway, when Adam authorizes it at various points in the game. Even the screw attack's fun to use again, working just like it did in the 2D games. Much better than it was in the Prime series. The beam weapons stack up again like they did in Fusion and Zero Mission, and in Prime 3. And also returning from the 2D games, which I'm surprised wasn't in the 3D games, is the Speed Booster and the Shine Spark, making Samus a deadly female version of the Flash, destroying anything in her path and jumping higher and farther at super speed. The space jump still doesn't let you travel an infinite amount of height, but it can still get you slightly higher and keeps your altitude intact, which can help you cross large gaps and breeze your way through previous rooms, so it's still pretty useful. The only new power-up to the Metroid series is the Diffusion Beam, which when firing a charge shot, the impact spreads to enemies next to the enemy you just shot. It's a pretty neat inclusion and one I wouldn't mind seeing in future games. If there are going to be future games. 
But this new way of playing also gives Samus arguably the most broken ability she'll ever receive, the dodge mechanic. Samus becomes invincible for a brief second, which not only helps avoid enemies, but also instantly charges up your shot, allowing for a quick and easy kill. There's a lot of room for a dodge mechanic to work, and you can essentially use it while you're trying to move away from the enemy. It's really easy to take advantage of this, so if you want to make this game harder for yourself, never move and charge your shot simultaneously. Don't use a series new concentration mode either, if you want more of a challenge. While holding the Wiimote upwards and pressing the A button, Samus can automatically refill her missiles in the last remaining energy tank, unless you acquire the reservation tanks to let you refill one more energy tank each. Some may argue this isn't really a necessary addition, but we don't think it's too bad. Also, while holding down the 1 button, if you approach an enemy that's dazed, you can perform a neat little finishing move that does a ton of damage to them. This was the kind of thing I expected to see in a Ninja Gaiden style Metroid game. It's just too bad the rest of the game isn't like that. However, even with all of your abilities at your disposal, there isn't much point in actually fighting a majority of the enemies, apart from locked doors, since they don't drop health or missiles or anything like that. And the only way to refill all of your health is to use one of the thankfully plentiful save stations, which also restocks your missiles. The only advantage you'll get from killing enemies is that clearing certain rooms will show you where an expansion is located, so make of that what you will. Going back to Adam authorizing upgrades, in his defense, as idiotic as his motives are for doing so, most of the time he allows Samus to use them at the appropriate moments, like letting her use the wave beam when she's blocked by glass walls, and the speed booster when she needs to break these large ice blocks and cross a gap. However, as many of you know, there's one certain moment where he could not have chosen a worse time to give you one of the upgrades. Yes, I'm talking about acquiring the various suit in Sector 3. Here's how it goes if you don't already know about this. Samus will eventually come across an insanely heated area that slowly deteriorates her health when she steps in. Any Metroid player's natural instinct would be to go back where you came and come back to that area later. But in Other M, you have to trudge through this part quickly and try not to lose all of your health, going against what you would normally do in a Metroid game. But even if you didn't get that idea, then you'd probably think that this would be the point where Adam authorizes your various suit, right? Any time now, Adam. Any time now. What is he on his coffee break? Where the hell is he? Samus, activate the barrier feature on your suit to protect yourself from heat damage. And since Samus isn't going to say anything about this god awful timing, I'm just gonna recreate how that would actually go. Oh, I love all of this Zero Suit fan art. Oh, crap! Uh, Samus, activate the barrier suit to protect yourself from heat damage. Are you Ooh, she's gonna bully kill you, mate. <laughs> oh well. Back to fan service. But seriously, folks, what the f was he doing this whole time? Why did he take so long to give you an essential power up? And why hasn't Samus realized that Adam just might not be the worthy father figure if he doesn't even allow her to use protection? In fact, she is so loyal to him, she doesn't activate the gravity suit herself until she's about to be sucked into space. Really late in the game. And there's another point where Samus has to save Anthony from a monster, but Adam chooses not to authorize the grappling beam until Samus looks at a grappling point to get to him. What kind of shit is that? The only time Samus makes the right decision in this game is when she decides to activate the screw attack and space jump without Adam's approval. Now that's the Samus we know, putting matters into her own hands. So even with all of these problems, you may be thinking that Other M's at least an exploration game, right? Ha! No freaking way. The progression in this game is as linear as a Metroid title can be. There is little to no exploration in this game, and almost every room acts as just one big corridor. It does take the Metroid Fusion route somewhat by splitting the areas into different sectors, but the ridiculous amount of linearity in Other M almost puts it right up there with Prime Hunters for not feeling at all like a Metroid game. Now, Metroid Fusion had its share of linearity too, don't get me wrong, but it often broke that illusion by having you figure out multiple paths to take because you either didn't have the right security lock, the right power-up, or there was an unexpected obstruction in your path. Other M barely does anything to change it up. It's all one long straight path from beginning to end. As for the bosses, eh, they're alright. Yeah, they're nowhere near as epic as the other games. Dodging and firing charged shots is pretty much the only way to beat them, with the occasional super missile or missile to the face. They're fairly easy to beat too and not enough fun sort of way. I was pleased to see Nightmare from Metroid Fusion again though, that was a nice return from him. The only boss battle I found myself really enjoying was the one against Ridley. 
As little sense as the cutscene made beforehand, this is one of the only parts of Other M that reminds me I'm playing a Metroid game. It's the part I look forward to the most every time I replay it. Ridley's even easier than most of the bosses in this game, but its fast pace makes for quite an exciting fight. I kinda wish more bosses were like this in Other M. Plus, she can also do this. Okay, that's pretty badass. Although, I do also wish that the graphics were a little better. Not so much with the CGI cutscenes, those are beautiful, especially for a Wii game. I'm mainly talking about the in-game graphics. The colors are a little solid for my liking, the environments are a bit blocky, and Other M overall in my opinion is just not quite as detailed as the Prime games were, which still look really nice today. The foley is just your typical blaster noises and enemy shrieks, and the music is... rather bad, honestly. There's very little music to be heard in the first place, and when there is, it's as forgettable as forgettable can be. The only songs I can remember off the top of my head are the title screen music, and possibly the best rendition of Ridley's theme song. It's all orchestrated and energized to make it feel big, and by god does it work. Alright, let's finish this off. Ridley escapes the fight, most of the Galactic Federation are dead, and Samus heads off to Sector Zero, which is where the invulnerable Metroids are. On her way there, she finds a baby Metroid. Adam shoots her in the back while she's distracted and decides to go into Sector Zero himself and activate the self-destruct sequence to wipe out all of the Metroids inside. He says he's sacrificing himself because he doesn't believe he can defeat Ridley. Though we're sure if you can immobilize Samus temporarily, you should stand a pretty good chance against Ridley. Samus tries to stop Adam from entering, but unfortunately is unable to get to him in time and we don't see him again until he becomes a computer in Metroid Fusion. Samus fulfills Adam's last order he gave of rescuing a survivor in the Bioweapon Research Center, where she comes across the corpse of James and the mummified remains of Ridley. Samus finds the survivor, but sees that she's too scared to confront her and opens a padlock containing... Queen Metroid? Didn't expect to see her again. The fight against her is a lot more involved than in Metroid 2. And the Queen Metroid now comes equipped with crystals on her back and bloody fire breath. She constantly gives birth to Metroids too, which is pretty gross when you think about it, but god damn are they annoying. These Metroids must have been given a spider sense upgrade of some sort because they constantly dodge your shots until you get lucky. I don't even know how I managed to beat them so quickly in this playthrough. When you do get rid of all the Metroids, however, the battle afterwards is just as easy as the other bosses, though I think I've accidentally exploited her attack patterns in this playthrough. All ending with a satisfying blast of a power bomb. Before you go any further, Josh, we should probably mention that you can't use power bombs prior to this part of the story. Oh god, I almost forgot about this. But that's just the icing on the cake. It's especially annoying because you learn how to use your power bombs at the beginning of the game, but never get to use them until the very end. Even then, Other M doesn't tell you that you can use power bombs before this part of the fight. Usually when you get a new power up, the game takes you to the menu and lets you know that you can use it. But not for power bombs, you just have to figure that stuff out yourself. You could argue that since Adam and the Galactic Federation are all dead, Samus would allow herself to authorize them, but no. You still can't use them until this very point of the game, no matter how hard you try. There's no prompt to be seen, no indication, nothing. You just have to find out by accident. Anyway, Samus defeats the Queen Metroid, leading up to our meeting with the woman we saw earlier, who tells her that she's the real Madeline Bergman, and that the Madeline Bergman we've come to know was the android of Mother Brain the entire time. Madeline further explains that MB was built to create a relationship with the Metroids, and over time she also thought of her like a daughter. However, she was taken away by the Galactic Federation for being seen as a threat. No, you think? And this undeniably made her a tad pissed off and go on a rampage. MB takes this well afterwards though, as she aims her gun at Samus and Madeline, but not before another group from the Galactic Federation arrive and attack MB, who retaliates by summoning the most dangerous creatures in the bottle ship that you would think Samus needs to destroy, but nah, you just need to aim at MB and the fight is over. A little anticlimactic, don't you think? Tell me about it. Madeline freezes MB with a blaster and the Galactic Federation shoot her down to a million little pieces. Afterwards, the Colonel steps in to basically tell Samus to sod off and that they can handle it from here. What an asshole! The Colonel then asks one of the troops to escort Samus out the battleship, who turns out to be Anthony, who survived his encounter with Ridley after all. So, hooray, I guess? And after one more monologue from our faithful heroine, the game just sort of ends. Huh. Expected a little bit more of a resolution than that. Up, oh, hold that thought, we're not quite done yet, because Samus goes back to the battleship to pick up something she forgot. At this point, you can collect any expansions you've missed and finally use power-ups on those several occasions you could have used them earlier. All of the remaining power-ups after finishing the story will be marked out on the map, which sort of defeats exploration in this game entirely, but some of them can still be rather tricky to find. If you're going for 100%, then you'll also have to confront many of the creatures that MB summoned who really hurt and can take a fair amount of damage. 
Once you do that and you're on your way to finding Samus' lost property, we come across... Fantoon from Super Metroid? Okay, kind of a random return, but he's the only boss that's given me any sort of trouble because of how much damage he does. Samus finishes off the ghostly creature and finds what she's looking for, which turns out to be Adam's helmet. This is actually a charming little scene. By God, they actually did it! They build character without using dialogue! Could it be that this game may truly be capable of deep storytelling? Mother of God, the countdown! What a bloody tease to think we could have actually had a nice touching moment! No idea why Samus doesn't put her power suit back on and why she's equipped herself with only a crappy little stun pistol. But Samus escapes the bottle ship before it blows up in traditional Metroid fashion, now ending the story of Other M. Completing the game 100% doesn't really do anything except unlock more pictures in the gallery, and also hard mode, where you can play the game again with only one energy tank and ten missiles. Trust me, it is a bitch to get through. <sighs> Guys, you all know what I'm gonna say. Other M has been criticized as one of the worst Metroid games ever made, and it's something I wholeheartedly agree with. But it's not a bad video game in general. Don't get me wrong, as a Metroid game, Other M is by all means of the word awful. But as a game itself, it honestly could have been a lot worse. The controls are clunky, the acting is hokey, the progression is far too linear, the environments are unoriginal, and the upgrade authorization makes no goddamn sense, but the game is still structurally sound. There wasn't a moment where I encountered a glitch or a shot went through an enemy or anything like that. And the controls are easy to learn and very responsive when you eventually do get the hang of it. The production values are also spectacular for a Wii game. I mean, did you look at these cutscenes and think it was an Xbox 360 or PS3 game? I sure did when I first played it. But the biggest problem Other M has going for it is its story, and it's mainly to do with how much of an easier time Samus would have had if she was allowed to use her damn upgrades. I get it, Samus respects the decisions of her father figure of a commander. But if it means endangering yourself and increasing your chances of death, then for heaven's sake, don't hesitate to use them once in a while. Especially if you're gonna wuss out at the sight of your parents' killer for the sixth time. But even if you can excuse that, it's hard to excuse the lack of character development and side plots that don't go anywhere. Like whatever happened to Madeline Bergman after leaving the bottle ship or who turned out to be the deleter. It's a shame about the story too, because there are actually a couple of well-developed moments between Samus and Adam, particularly near the end, and the climax I thought had a pretty good twist in it. I liked the idea of MB growing human emotions and seeing Madeline as a mother, despite being an android. But unfortunately, by the time the story starts to get interesting, the game's over and I'm left unfulfilled. Since there also aren't multiple endings or satisfying rewards for finishing the game fast enough or at 100% like in the other Metroid games, there's very little replay value to Other M. In fact, the first time I recorded this last year, that was the first time I'd picked up the game since January of 2011. That's how little this game has left an impression on me. I don't even know where to begin on my final thoughts of the game. Actually, yes I do. For starters, the controls. Just everything about them was plain bad. In particular, the fact that we're using a D-pad to move in a 3D game. That, and we were given two choices. Choice number one, shoot weak little enemies while on the go. Or choice number two, stay completely still and take a beating to fire a strong missile. Neither of these make for efficient combat. I also thought the story was a bit of a disappointment, and being unable to use your equipment unless you had authorization was just a stupid plot point. Especially after Adam disappears and Samus still decides to hold back on a power up or two. I mean seriously, she was in an active volcano, on the verge of burning to death, and Adam decided he wants to be a dick to Samus? I mean, how freaking dumb could you possibly be to do that? The plot was pretty predictable too. The only thing that caught me by surprise, legitimately, was MB's true identity. I really didn't see that coming. But Anthony's survival, I saw coming from a mile away. I suppose Samus breaking down at the sight of Ridley surprised me too, but not for the good reason. It's because of how baffling it was that she would still do that. Overall though, the game was alright at best. The fact that it was so linear was alright for a newcomer like myself to know where I'm going, but I can easily see this being a bad thing for a veteran to the Metroid series who like an open world game. This game just held your hand way too much as it literally showed you where to go and how to get there room by room. To me that was fine, but to a veteran that's just insulting. All in all, I don't personally find Other M to be quite as bad as Prime Hunters in terms of feeling nothing like a Metroid game. 
For one thing, at least Other M still has some platforming to it, puzzles to solve, and doesn't want to entirely focus on shooting, unlike Prime Hunters, which mainly wanted to be a first-person shooter. But despite that, some gameplay decisions are pretty backwards, mainly when the game tries to use the Wii's controls to make things simple and immersive for the players. The one tacked-on gimmick you'll see the most often is when at times during the story you need to look around and use the Wii Mote to point out clues, and the answer is usually something ridiculously tiny that you need a magnifying glass to see, or rather thermal vision in a couple of cases. In fact, I only know where to put the pointer because of multiple playthroughs. This other small issue isn't from a motion gimmick, but Samus will also at times trudge very slowly until you reach your destination, which doesn't take very long, but they sure as hell feel like it. If you can look past all those technical quirks, then you may find a little bit of enjoyment from Other M. And I think Nintendo should have another go with this sort of gameplay style, because there is a lot of potential for it. But coming from a perspective of a huge Metroid fan, Other M is fine as is, but for a Metroid game, it completely misses the mark and ends up being one of the weakest in the series. Right, well, I guess that's me done. The review's over, so you don't need me anymore. Okie dokie, well thanks very much for helping me out today, John. Anytime. I'm always happy to help those who've got nothing better to do with their lives than complain about games on the internet. Again, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's over. We've just finished covering every single Metroid game in existence. It's not like the Tomb Raider reviews where I've left a few spin-offs. There's really no more Metroid games left to discuss. There are a few black spots here and there, but the Metroid series is something I can highly recommend to anybody who's a lover of the sci-fi action-adventure genre and to those who enjoy exploring the unknown. And one of the great things about them is that you can almost start from anywhere and understand what's going on. And there are so many extremely well-crafted Metroid games out there. Metroid Zero Mission, Metroid 2, Super Metroid, Metroid Fusion, Metroid Prime 1, Metroid Prime 3. All wonderful titles that I seriously cannot suggest enough worth playing. It may take a good while for new games to come out, but when they are released, most of them are of high quality and good fun. Again, most of them. Samus Aran, let us hope we see you again fairly soon. Well, look on the bright side, at least we have Federation Force to look forward to. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't say that with a straight face. That does it for the Metroid games, so what other video game series could we continue talking about? Well, a certain stealth franchise comes to mind, and we've had a brand new entry come out several months ago. But before we cover that, we've got to catch up on the story leading to it. So I will see you guys later when we cover Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker for the PSP. My name's Josh Smith, I praise the treasure, and I pick apart the trash. See you all next time. See, it is trying to be like Metal Gear.